Amen. Amen. Thank you, Matt and Lauren. What a blessing. What a good worship time this morning in music. If you paid attention to what you were singing, uh, boy, then you worshiped the Lord through that as, uh, as well I did. Uh, boys and girls in the children's uh, church time, you can slip out at this time. As they're going out, let me make a couple of announcement comments. One is, um, <clears throat> uh, Muffy was telling me this morning that Beverly is back in the hospital and uh, not doing well. Uh, she, she, I didn't know. She was telling me that she has leukemia, and I didn't know that. And it's also uh, cancer is involved, and uh, there's some uh, big things coming there. And so we just uh, want to lift her up in prayer and just want to let you know that so that you can be mindful of it. Uh, in these days, and be sure and pray for her. Also, I know several have already asked me about the pastor because they saw I was mic'd up. That has a double meaning, by the way, if you know me. So, that's mic'd up. But, no, the, the pastor's okay. He had actually let uh, talked to me a couple of weeks ago uh, because uh, when they were planning to go down to PCC and see some of the kids and and spend some time with them on a, I think it was Thursday night, they went. They were there. Uh, he, they decided to just take a little weekend and relax and, you know, rest up some. And, and uh, I, I didn't get to hear it. I, I wasn't here for the message last Sunday, but I listened to it on the way back. And uh, oh, as God used him to share a very special message. And uh, so I know people were concerned when they saw me mic'd up this morning, but uh, as far as I know, things are okay. Uh, but just some needed rest, and uh, we look forward to having him back. Uh, this next week. Um, I think that's all that I was told to do. So, All right, if you have your Bible this morning, and I trust you do, you can open it to the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 1. Another thing the pastor asked me if I would consider and pray about doing this morning was to uh, continue his series on fishing with Howard. And uh, so we're doing that this morning. Uh, from Mark chapter 1, we're going to be looking at, uh, that's a little bit of the outline there, but let me preface that a little bit, because I, I got into this, and I got to thinking about fishing, and of course fishing is such an interesting subject anyway. Uh, I'm sure, like me, uh, when you're going down the road or sitting at a traffic light, you read bumper stickers. I do that all the time. You just can't help it, hardly. Some I wish I didn't see, but you know, some I enjoy reading. But uh, a lot of things about fishing, and there's a lot of bumper stickers and, and uh, window stickers now. People put things all over the back windows and such. And, and I got to thinking, well, you know, when you see those stickers, you realize there's at least two kinds of fishermen. There's those that are just out for fun, just have a little good time, and they approach fishing that way. And you can tell that by, by some of the stickers, you know, because they will say, they, well, one of the most popular is, I'd rather be fishing. Well, that's nice. That, you know, they they'd like to have a little a little fun like that. Uh, another one, um, maybe like a little play on words, hooked on fishing, which I like to play on word types of things. Uh, especially this one, it says, "Please hold, I'm on the other line." Some of you might think about that one, but uh, I, I like that one. Or life is good and fishing makes it even better. Well, that, that kind of tells you about an attitude of fishing a little bit by a fisherman that's out for fun and just enjoys the sport. But then there's those serious people. Uh, you read some of those bumper stickers. And, uh, you know, like, give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish, he'll never go to work again. You know, it, that's a serious fisherman. When, 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 you, when you think about it, and uh, some of these guys, you know, they, they, they put fishing before a lot of other things. Like one said, education is important, but fishing is more important. Some of you caught, some of you caught that, you know. Or, or the one that says, old fishermen never die, they just smell that way. Oh, my goodness. That's a serious fisherman, you know. But the most serious is the one I saw where it said, I don't go fishing, I go catching. Now there's a serious fisherman. 
And these are the things we're going to talk about this morning when we look at this, this statement of Jesus. Mark chapter 1, and we saw it in Matthew chapter 4. The pastor has talked about that. Uh, so go with me, if you will, to Mark chapter 1. Let's just take a glance at it, the, uh, the context that's involved. And it starts in verse 16, Mark chapter 1. And it says, Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. Why? For they were fishers, or fishermen, we would say. That was their career. That was their livelihood. Keep going. Verse 17, Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. That's our statement. But let's continue to look. Straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. That can be a little surprising to read that. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. And straightway he called them. I guess the same words. And they left their father, Zebedee, in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. When he says, come after me, or as... as Matthew writes it, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. What's he really saying? Now, it, it's quite obvious, isn't it? I mean, when you read it, you think, okay, we're talking about evangelism here. We're talking about fishing for souls. We're talking about going after those who need the Lord and tell them about Jesus. And we can say it how many ways. But to what extent... Is he saying those words? Our series title is Fishing with Howard. And you know the background to that with the burden that Howard had shared one night on Wednesday night about wanting to see 12 people saved by the beginning of 2019. That's what began this series. And each time I think the pastor has had a subtitle, and I'm going to give you a subtitle today, and the subtitle is this, Tagging Along or Totally In. You know, we don't know what the disciples might have said, or these guys, they became disciples when he called them, when he invited them, when he encouraged them, or however we want to say it. If they were saying, Oh yeah, and start asking some questions. Well, what do you mean? Or, uh, where are we going? Or how are we going to do this? Or how long are we going to be there? Or you know, because sometimes people say, hey, "Come on, let's go do so and so," and you just think it's a one-time event, right? And so you'll either go tagging along, or you'll go totally in, depending on how you feel about that. And so I. I picked three words. We're going to examine this, this statement. He says, come after me or follow me. He says, we're going to use the word change. I will make you or I will make you to become. And then we're going to use a third word that's catcher. A catcher of men. A catcher of people. So three C's there for us. And you, you see it up there. The first thing we notice is when he says come, what he means is commit to something. To commit to follow me. Now it wouldn't have been an issue in, in that day when he says in Matthew, follow me. Because in the Jewish mindset, and we're big on that around here because it gives you the clearest interpretation of what's, what these writers are writing, who they're writing to, and, and how they're saying that. And the implication is, become my disciple. Disciple? What's a disciple? It's a student. Become my student. Study under me. Now the Pharisees did that. Sadducees. They would get disciples. They would pick young men to come and study under them. 
to study what they believe, to study how they live, to study what their behaviors are, to study what their goals are, to study why they're doing what they're doing, and that they want to be like them. We have a good example, by the way, in Scripture. A man named Gamaliel. You remember hearing about him, reading about him, and who referred to him? We find out that Paul was a student, was a disciple of Gamaliel in his early days before Christ. Gamaliel was a, a known theological leader of the Sanhedrin. And Saul, later Paul, was one of his disciples. And he later gained real credibility with the Jewish leadership because he was a student. He was a disciple of Gamaliel. So to, to follow someone had this aspect of, of students or disciples where you spend lots of time listening to them, watching them, going with them where they go, observing their life to be like them. And so this is what Jesus was saying. When he says come, it equals commitment. It doesn't mean for a day. It doesn't mean for a few weeks. In a sense, it means for a lifetime. Because it's not a pastime, it's a lifetime. You know, with, as believers, we're to be followers of Christ. But you know what? We don't, aren't necessarily the same followers as other people are followers. I dare say there's some of us sitting in this room today are following Jesus as a pastime. We do it when it's convenient. We know it's a good thing. We want to know some things. We want to hear some things. We want to be a part of some things. We're glad that, that Jesus Christ died for our sins and we trusted Him as our Savior. And now we know we're going to heaven. And uh, there's a lot of good things that I, I can learn and, and do and be and see some changes in my life. When it's convenient, when I got time, when I feel like it, when it's not something else is going on that gets in the way. And, and we just pick and choose when we're going to follow Christ along with everything else going on in our life. That's like saying, hey, let's go fishing. Well, let me check my calendar. You know, if you've got to check your calendar to follow Christ, it's a past time. If you get up on Sunday morning and you've got to decide what you're going to do today, it's a pastime. We can be followers of Christ as a pastime or for a lifetime. Jesus was calling him for a lifetime. How do we know that? Because it, it unveils itself all the way through the New Testament. These guys were in it for the life. And you say, well, just like that, that happened? No, not just like that, because if you put the Gospels together, you'll find out this was not their first encounter with Jesus. You know, if you go through Scripture, you find it at three times, at least three times, or this is the third time, where they've encountered Jesus. As a matter of fact, some of these guys, his disciples, were followers of John the Baptist before they were Jesus. If you go to John chapter 1, it unveils itself as you go through that, that chapter of how uh, John the Baptist had, had students, he had disciples, he had followers, he had men that were with him. And when Jesus was baptized, he pointed them to Jesus. You go through John, you read that text, and he says the next day after he was baptized, he came and John told his guys, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And in essence, he was saying, This is the guy I was telling you about, go get him now. He passed them on to Jesus. And it says that Andrew was one of those that was following. And what did he do? He went and got his brother Peter and brought him back. And he encountered Jesus. And, you know, and then there was James and there was John. He says Philip was one of those guys in John chapter 1. And, and, and so, you know, so it just goes on. Nathaniel. And so these guys had encounters before this. So when Jesus comes to them, they had already spent some time with him. They had already been with John the Baptist. They had already been discussing. They had already been talking. They, it's been some lapse of time. They had already met Jesus. They had already heard some about him. They had seen a little about him. And so no doubt on the fishing boat, that was a big subject of conversation. 
when these guys sat down to to uh, to relax with the other guys from the other boats and stuff like that. No doubt they had conversations. And so when Jesus came, he wasn't a new guy. He was already somebody they'd been thinking about. He'd already somebody they'd been discussing. He had already impacted their lives in some way. And most of the time, before people come to Christ, somebody has pointed them to Him. Somebody has talked to them about Him. And that's what happened with these. So when He comes here in Matthew 4 and, and, and Mark 1, and He says, follow me, it wasn't just off the cuff. Jesus was saying, I want you guys to come and be my disciples. And that's why when it says straightway, they just lift their nets and follow Him. And we see that we don't see Him going back, do we? You followed on through the Gospels. He walked with it. They walked with Him. They, they listened to Him. They watched Him. They followed Him. They were by His side. They ate with Him. They ba he lived with Him for three years. And they didn't go back. For them, it wasn't a pastime. It was a lifetime. And so we look at this commitment. Jesus didn't call these guys just because He wanted somebody to hang out with. Oh, let's go spend the day together. Have some downtime. No. He called these guys because He wanted to invest in them. His life. What a difference that is. So we might just start with that question this morning as we begin to move through this. Am I a follower of Christ as a pastime or a lifetime? We can say what we want. They could have said what they want, but you know what? Scripture it's like a video that just shows us for them it was a lifetime. And that's what it should be for us. Well, let's go to that second one. I use the word change. Why? Because he says, I will make you to become. What does that imply? It implies that there's going to be change in your life. Whatever you are now, he's fixing to change it up. And so I use that word change. One reason is because it's a C, but it really it's very effective as, as a C. And as this word change, I will make you. What's he going to do? He's going to take you where you are, and he's going to make something different. That can be scary or it can be comforting. A lot of times it's scary on the front, but comforting later, isn't it? Oh, man. That's why, you know, if, if, you're, if you're following Jesus as a pastime, you're going to be scared half the time. If you're following Jesus as a lifetime, you're going to be comforted. And it's just going to get better and better and better. But look what he says, I will make you to become. The implication, something you're not right now. You know, I think about a makeover. That's a big lady thing. Isn't it getting a makeover or something? I've seen stuff like that on TV. But it's all about changing the outside when you look at it that way. You know? Jesus says, yeah, I'm going to give you a makeover. We're going to start with the inside. He's going to change your heart. When He changes your heart, He changes your values. What does that mean? When He changes your heart, you begin to see things the way He sees things instead of the way you saw things. He's going to change your heart. He's going to change your mind. So that you're not going to think the way you used to think. Because before Christ, my thoughts centered around me. Didn't they? Maybe yours didn't, but mine did. Life was all about me. And when we're not saved, that's, that's the center of us, is me. But when, when we follow Christ, when we see what He's done for us, and we see the, what He does in us, and the changes that He makes, it, life becomes about Him, not about me. What a change that is. My first reality check on that was when I got married and I found out, uh-oh, you mean my life's supposed to be about her now? One of the reasons marriages don't work for a lot of people is because we go into marriage thinking that, life, that marriage is about me. And that other person's thinking the same thing. So now you've got two me's running into each other all the time. But when you look at marriage the way God meant it, especially us men, He said, hey, your life's about her. And then we look at the women and he says, you know what? Your life's about him. That's why he says love and submit. 
What powerful words those are to say, my life is now all about her. My life is now all about him. Because that's the way it is with Christ. He is the center of these things. And so he says, come and follow me, and I will make your life more than you ever thought it could be. Why? Because I'm going to make your life like mine. That's his goal, to invest himself in them so that they would be like him. Why did Saul want to follow Gamaliel? Because he was the top echelon of the Jewish leadership. If there was a godly man, it should have been him because he was right at the top of the top. And so I'm sure old Saul thought, I want to be like him. And he strove to do that. And I mean, he did it with passion and zeal. And when this new way, when this, this Jesus came on the scene and they opposed him, that meant Saul opposed him, right? Because he thought like they did. He felt like they did. He had the goals that they did. And so when they went after Jesus, he went after Jesus. And he did it with full passion. This guy was all in, wasn't he? Oh, Saul. And so when he turned to Christ, what happened then? Wow. What a change. What a difference. When he turned and followed Jesus. And Jesus began to make him like him. So this change, he says, I'll change your heart, your values, no longer about yourself, but about Jesus. I'll change your life so that you become like him. And that's what these guys did for three years, living with Jesus, listening, watching, and, and being with Jesus. They saw him. I want to be like that. You know, as a pastime, you don't get to that level. And I guess that's why I was never really a serious fisherman. I grew up in South Alabama, near the Gulf. I did my share of fishing in that sense of just the average person. But I never became an ad avid fisherman. Too many other interests. Too many things going on. And here in the later years, I've had people say, hey, hey you, you like to fish? I said, oh, yeah, I like to fish. I'm just remembering 40 years ago, you know. You want to go fishing sometime? Uh, let me check my calendar. Right? Why? Because I hadn't been fishing in I don't know how many years. Because why? Interest has changed. It was a pastime. You know? It was a pastime. But what happens is the more they spent time with Jesus, the more they wanted to be like Him. When we get all in, folks, life is going to change. As long as we're sitting on the fence, it's just going to be frustrating. A pastime Christianity is a very frustrating life because we don't understand how it works and we don't understand why God's not answering every time I holler and need something. And why, why about this? And what about that? And I don't know how to understand this thing. I just don't see how this is going to work. Because it's a pastime. We're not all in. But these guys got all in. And man, you're talking about living a Christian life. It was amazing to see what happened. One of, my, one of the greatest examples I love so much about this change is over in um, Acts chapter 4. And you don't have to turn there. It's a long passage. I'm just going, I'll just comment about it. Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, where Peter and John, this was right after Pentecost, and they'd received the Holy Spirit because when Jesus went back, He left the Holy Spirit to take His place. And then the church began. And we'll, we'll get to some of that in a moment. But they were going up to the temple to pray, and they met this lame man that's always there, been there for years and years and years, out of the gate. And he wanted some coins. They didn't have any coins. He said, okay, but such as we have, we'll give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And they think about him lifting him up and he was healed. You know why? Why? Why did they do that? How could they do that? Because they'd been with Jesus. You'd be amazed at what happens in your life when you spend time with Jesus. You hear me? You'd be amazed. I'm amazed. I stand amazed week after week after week at what Jesus does in my life and through my life. I'm just amazed. Well... The Sanhedrin got word of that. They didn't like that. They called these guys in and, and they stood before them and they complained and they fussed and they did all of this. They said, oh, you know, we just have to obey God rather than man. That's our first priority. That's when you're all in, by the way. My first priority is to follow God. My first priority is to serve Jesus. 
And it says there that they looked on these guys and they marveled. Why did they marvel? Because they were just ordinary men, unschooled. They hadn't been the students of the great leaders, you know. They were just average guys. But average guys filled with the power of God change things. When we're all in for Jesus, our life changes and others do too. The third thing we run into here is the catcher of people. What do you say? Come after me, follow me, and I'll make you to become something you're not, something that's different. And what's that different? Fishers of men. And I like that bumper sticker, so I borrowed that term. He'll make us catchers. Catchers. You know, fishing can be a pastime, but catching serious business. Because the guy that goes out to catch, he's not planning on coming home until he gets something. You know what I'm saying? Jesus wanted to make them catchers of people. Why? Simple question, simple answer. Because that's what he was. That's who he is. He stood up when Zacchaeus put his faith in him. And he says, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. He says, I came here to catch people. I came here to give my life on the cross so that others would be caught. Others would be saved. That was his priority in life on this earth. Now what's he going to pass on to these guys following him? Listen, you need to live a good moral life. You need to go to the temple every Sunday. You need to tell other people about me. His first priority was what? Catching. Look through the Gospels and see how he lived. He went about daily catching, 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 catching. And he did that through a number of ways. Preaching, teaching, healing, helping, feeding. Just you name it. But it was all about catching. Number one goal of those who follow Christ, what should it be? Hmm. Catching. You say, what about church? You know, what about all the things we do in church? Okay, let's put it into perspective right quick. What took Jesus' place when he went to heaven? He left his spirit and he instituted his church. And the church is our training camp. That's our discipleship center. That's where He has provided the leaders. He's provided the helps. He's provided the tools. He's provided the means for us to be like Him, to learn about Him, to grow in Him, to follow Him. We do that through that institution and network of the church that He gives us. In the church, no doubt, if we go there, we're going to find people to follow. The Lord's given us a great pastor here. Man of the Word. A life that follows the Lord. He's given us some great leaders here because I sit and I watch these guys. He's given us some good leaders to follow. You've got good people here to follow, to listen to, to learn from in, in the classes, in the growth groups, in the messages, and all the things that go on. We've got people that are further down the road than we are that can pass on the life of Jesus that He has been living through them that we haven't gotten to yet, so that we know better how to do that and get to that point. He's given us a network of other people who know how to catch through many different means and teach us to do that. What do I mean? Catching comes in a lot of forms. Well, some people do it very easily in their speech. Some people don't. Some people catch people through baking goods. God's given them a blessed gift. I don't know that it's mentioned in the Scripture, but the ability to cook delicious stuff. You know? 
Because the love of Jesus is what is, is what's on the end of the hook. It's the love of Jesus expressed through something that says, come and follow Jesus. And you get that cake, you get those goodies, you get those brownies, you get those things that say, where did this come from? And it came, I just want to do that for you. And tell you about Jesus. Maybe we stuck a little card in there. Maybe there's a, a little track in there. Maybe there's a little something in there. Maybe there's a, just, just something that says, in the name of Jesus, I want to give you this. Well, Jesus, you know, it's there. Most anything we do in life can be used to catch. There's an old story I tell about when I was pastoring. I don't have time to do the long version. But we had a neighbor, the guy that lived right next door to the church that I pastored before. Ornery, mean, didn't know the Lord. And he'd been witnessed to a thousand times, I know. But if, if, a, if a kid kicked a ball over in his yard, he'd keep it. That's the kind of guy I was. So we finally had to put up a fence because we kept losing too many balls. And uh, every week he's, uh, 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 every, every week he'd be out there mowing his little yard, little, little bitty house, little bitty yard, and I mean, he's just kind of grumbling and grumpling, and you know, he didn't, you couldn't go talk to the guy just you know, all this. But man, he tried to take care of his yard big time. And shorten the story a whole lot over time, never could really get close to the guy. We'd speak every now and then, that's about it. But I noticed one week his yard was not mowed. And I thought, whoa. What would happen to old Pee Wee? Nickname. And so I, I noticed that every day when I'd come to the office and his car wasn't mowed and his car was gone. I thought, oh, what happened to him? But didn't know. So about the middle of the second week, I mean, the grass is now getting on up there. And I just felt the Lord saying, You need to go cut this guy's yard. And I'm saying, Lord, he comes back and finds out it's me. I've had it. But I went over and cut the man's yard. And you know what? That that didn't do much for you. You think he came back and God, you know, softened his heart and he came to Christ. No, that didn't happen. But you know what did happen? The lady in the, that lived in the house on the other side of him, she came out there when I was mowing. And she gave me the what for? Why in the world are you mowing this guy's yard? Why would you come over there? As much as he hates you guys, as much as he does all that, he hated her too. You know, and so she's just going down the road and she could not understand why in the world I would come over there and mow this guy's yard. So I was beginning to tell her, I said, because I think the Lord wanted me to. And I began to tell her about Jesus. And God softened her heart. You never know. You can use a lawnmower and catch people. Now for them, he took them out of fishing and they had to leave the family business and, 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 and dad and, and all of that career and God put them in another career, you know, totally catching fish like pastors and evangelists and such. Well, that's their full-time work. He might do that for you. He might not do that for you. He may do that in a different way for you through what he's already given you. I think about a guy that I've heard about for, for uh, many, many, many years. His name is uh, Barry McGuire. If you're a car guy, you've heard of him, I'm sure. Uh, if you're not, you might not have. But, but uh, Barry McGuire is a third generation, I want to say car care products guy. His, his great-grandfather developed furniture polish back in the who knows 20s, 30s, or whatever that was just outstanding stuff for homes and all of this, and then the next generation and such. And he brought in then polishes and waxes and all of this for cars and became uh, internationally known, his products, McGuire's. You go to Walmart or whatever, you'll see some of his products on the shelf. And uh, so that Barry McGuire came up in that, in that context. Third generation of these products, these uh, high-quality products. So we're talking about the, the people with the highest of... Uh, inline cars and all of that. They wanted his products to, to keep their cars done. But that's not what's most important in Barry McGuire's life. Most important is when he came to Christ. And he had a desire to catch people. And I just I, I want to just share a little, 
little, little tidbit about that. He says, in 1973, one man changed my life forever. Ignoring his national prominence, his passion for leading people to the Lord permeated his very existence, and his stories were captivating. You see, when we're all in, people are going to be impressed about that. When they see the level of our devotion and our passion for Jesus Christ and living for Him and sharing Him, it's going to touch people's lives no matter where we work, no matter where we are, no matter where we go, no matter what we do. He says, I immediately wanted to have the joy He had in His life in my own life. You see, it, it goes out there. It'll catch people. He says, in 1976, after three years of exciting faith sharing, understand that, and that's what Barry McGuire is more known for than his products in the Christian world, is this man has a passion and is avid about sharing Christ, and the Lord has given him unlimited venues, and he's had, he's had uh, car shows all over the world that he goes and he's part of. He goes to all these events and sponsors all these events, and so he has thousands of people that he's able to talk to, and they think they're going to talk to him about his products, and he's going to talk to them about Jesus. Because that's what's most on his heart. Yep, yep, they're good products, you know, all this, yeah, that's great, but let me tell you what's better than that, you know. And the Lord gave him a passion for telling people about Christ. So much so that he says, I asked God if he wanted me to go into full-time ministry. Less than 20 minutes later, the Spirit of the Lord led a man I didn't know into my office with the message. Your business is your pulpit. He says, I have never questioned God's purpose for my life again. He didn't take him out of the family business and make him full time. He was ready. He was willing. He wanted to follow the Lord fully, totally, in every way that God would want him to. And if that's what it meant, that was fine. But God sent him a message and said, no, your business is your pulpit. Your business is your platform. And through that, he could encounter far, far more people than he would in a church somewhere, traveling all over the world. Where God's put us is where he wants us to catch people. And so we've got to think about this. Are we serving God past time or lifetime? It may be today that you're undecided on that question. We'll never be a follower of Jesus until we come to know Jesus as our Savior. Sometimes we're just on the fringe and we think we're following. It may be that we've taken those first steps and we've gotten kind of involved a little bit, but we've not sold out for Him yet. And, and maybe the, the most difficult thing is that Jesus' passion was catching people. For eternity. And sometimes I think we get a little too settled in our world of church. We enjoy the worship, we enjoy the music, we enjoy the study, we enjoy the atmosphere, we enjoy the friendships, we, we enjoy, enjoy being a part of all of that, but we don't necessarily get around much to catching people. We get so far and we stop. And there's more to do. You know, are we really all in if we're not using what God has given us to catch people with the gospel? It's a challenge to me. Maybe a, a challenge to you today, where you are. If God's speaking your heart about hmm, taking another step, making another move, or maybe the first move in coming to know Him as your Savior, listen to Him today. Let's not be tagging along. Let's be all in. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this time. Speak to these hearts as we close as You've been speaking to my heart, Lord. And I know there's, there's more I need to do. There's more steps I need to make. I'm not there yet. Lord, I pray that our desire to be like You and to follow You would be such that we would be ready to take any more steps you want us to, Lord, and be all in. Guide us as we close now. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.